Today's scripture reading is Mark 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stem, the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of God. Got a wonderful full service today. So a little less time than usual, and so let's get right at it. Um, for those of you who, who were here last week, you know this, this is the same passage. And last week, um, I taught to you right out of the central doctrine of Christianity that the first part I said was this question, who then is this? That's what the disciples asked. And we're asking the question, who is this Jesus? And in the second part, I told you about what this passage is saying, that only God can control the waves, that there are prophets who have done miraculous, stunning things. They could say things like, there's going to be no rain, <laughs> okay? There's not going to be, uh, they could even, uh, there's been prophets who even raise the dead, but nobody can control the waves and the seas. And that's why these uh, disciples were terrified at the end of the story. And, and then I led you in the third part of last week's message to start thinking about this question. Who is God in your storm? Do you have a storm in your life? And I really want to pick up today in that way. And today's message is very much a, a kind of um, continuation of that third portion I think it's worth sitting in this passage one more time and wrestling with this question about storms, okay? So part one, the inevitable storms of your life. They are inevitable. The inevitable storms of your life. Part two, the ultimate storm of the cross. <laughs> the ultimate storm of the cross. And part three, more than conquerors through Emmanuel. How can we get through storms? And that's a big question today. People, there's so many people who are depressed and, um, and really struggling and not sure if they can just manage in life. And today I want to give you a piece of great hope and grace, more than conquerors through Emmanuel. So part one, the inevitable storms of your life. Let's go to this passage. So I'll just reread these first two verses. On that day, this couple, first couple of verses, when G an evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the boat, the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. So, you know, you're going in your life. You're going to go from here to over there. There are journeys in life. And maybe the other side of where you're going to go, you've never been there before, or it's uncertain. And so you're going to take this journey, and you're going to maybe have to go through some waters. Verse 37, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. Now, is that going on? You're going to go from here. So there, you hope the waters will be really, really calm, be really, really smooth sailing. But what if it isn't? But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I talked about this last week. Um, not all of the disciples in this boat, but a number of them were fishermen. And they know what it's like when 
it's like there's a storm. OK, yeah, this is kind of not fun. But I think we're going to make it. We're going to make it to the other side. This is kind of choppy, rough. And maybe some water will slosh in here, but we'll, we're going to make it. But this was nothing like that. They're saying, we're going to go down. <laughs> we're going to die. I think we're going to die today. <laughs> and that's what I want to ask you about. I don't know in a room even this size. It's not a large room. There's tons of people here. Um, there's, you may be going through something where in your life, your life is like the boat. And water is not supposed to be sloshing into this thing. And what if it's coming in pretty serious, pretty bad? And you go, I, I don't know if we're going to make it. And I'm not sure. Maybe it's not quite as dramatic as if we don't make it through this, we're going to die. But it'll be really, really bad. <laughs> if we don't, if I don't get this next job, then my debt numbers are going to be in a really, really bad place. If, um, if, if uh, I can't get through this sickness, or maybe if my mom can't get through this sickness, or if my wife can't get through this sickness, or if my child can't get through the sickness, I, I don't know if I can keep going <laughs> on the other side. Now, some of you are thinking, Come on, Pastor, it's just a story about them going on a boat. Is this really a metaphor for big, terrible storms in our life? Is that really what you're doing? Aren't you just kind of like reading into the passage? So I want to take you to a, a, the passage. I gave this to you last week, but I want to take you to this passage. Psalm 107. It goes like this. This is, I actually read this out of the, at the beginning of service, and um, it's actually... A, Psalm 107 is a remarkable, incredible chapter. It's a poetic picture of a life, life, just dealing with life. And here's what, where I just want to just take you this. Then they cried to Yahweh in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. So here they're talking about they're going through the seas. And they're supposed to, they think they're going to make business. It even says that they have all these evil plans. <laughs> Because how do you think uh, global trade happened back then? It happened on the seas. Yeah. Today it happens with clicks. It still happens on the seas, actually. But today, a lot of global plans happen. You know, you're on a Zoom call. You're making an important deal with someone on the other side of the world. All the software flings back and forth. But still, things have to travel on the seas. And then they would get on the seas, and then, like this. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. When you have this story here in the Gospel of Mark, it isn't just Jesus saying, I'm powerful and I'm going to reveal to the, without saying I'm God, I'm going to let these people know, I'm not just a miracle man. I'm not just a prophet. There's more of who is in this boat with you. And, but really, what he's also saying is, life is like this. <laughs> all throughout the Old Testament, there are all these passages like this. And as he walks, as he does this, he is saying, I am the one who stills the seas. <laughs> I am the one, I'm the only one who could do this. I'm the only one that could rescue you when the water starts to slosh in. I want to just say something's that when I was younger, um, you didn't have to say this. Okay? Um, if you said this in front of a bunch of adults, they probably would have been offended. <laughs> but I think today, it's worth saying. And I'm going to say this. And um, I hope this doesn't offend any of you, but this is the thing I want to say, that life is painful and hard. <laughs> life regularly has storms, regularly. <laughs> They'll make you think you're going to go down or you're not going to make it to the other side. This is normal life. And let me say it this way. Not only is life hard, 
Did you know that life is actually supposed to be hard? <laughs> and what I mean by that is the Bible says that God made all things good. But then human beings decided that we want life without God. <laughs> we chose he didn't, we don't want him to be our king. We don't want him. We don't want his wisdom. We don't want his laws. We don't want his reign. We don't want even his presence. We want to get, it, get on with it without him. That's what makes life totally normal today. And life is totally normal. You guys can feel this, that there's only so many people here in this room. Why? Because this strange thing, people call it religion, to think that life should have God <laughs> and that you should sacrifice time. Heck, you should even give money <laughs> to this invisible God that most people think, I don't even know if he exists. And so in our city, it's completely just taken for granted that life, God, may be optional, maybe. And it feels like we don't need him. But life without God, let me say something to you. It's called, the Bible, the theologians have a word for it. It's called fallen. It was supposed to be at a higher and better place because it's supposed to be with God. And then when he's not there, then everything falls apart. So because all of creation and your life, your life in it, your mind is fallen, your hearts are fallen, your desires are fallen, so is all the other people around you. Our very culture is built on this. It's to build, like we're going to go, we as a people, let's just say our culture is like a boat, and we're going to go from here to there. We want peace and prosperity and riches and wealth, right? But so we're going to take this boat from here to there, and you know what? There's not going to be any God in this boat. And when there's no God in this boat, then creation will slosh because now it's cursed. <laughs> so people think sin is just this mean idea <laughs> that religious people came up with. But do you know whether you believe in God or not, you're experiencing the curse of sin all the time. <laughs> and sin is not primarily, here's some rule, something that God wants us to be like and do, and I you know what? I don't even know if he exists, so I'm not going to do that. That is sin, but at, at a deeper level, sin is even worse than that. It's just simply life without God. <laughs> We're not going to have God. We don't know how to find him, not even sure we need him, and that's what it's like. And with that said, life is going to be hard. <laughs> sometimes it's our own fault, and sometimes it's not, but curse is everywhere. <laughs> And we as people, we, this is what we live in. So let me just say a couple things here. We live in a time today when we're so like, rich and prosperous. It's really strange. The more prosperous and the more advantage you have, the more people think they don't need God. If you have the most brilliant doctors in the world, they could solve this problem. Why do we need God? If we have... a if we have brilliant people to run a great economy and invent new things that never even existed 10 or 20 years ago, I mean, we just have, we have things that just seem, um, we have inventions today. I, I, okay, I, I'm, I'm a Star Trek fan. You should watch Star Trek from 1966. Captain Kirk pulls out this thing and he goes, <laughs> and he calls up, you know, this, uh, the Enterprise. And you know what? We have that today. It's called a smartphone. You pull out this thing, and you're just like, except you're not calling up a spaceship. You're just talking to somebody on the other side of the world. It's actually better than what Captain Kirk had, because you could do the video. You're like, I want to talk to my girlfriend and the other side of the world. You could do that. And so because we have these powers, I think maybe we don't need God. <laughs> but the storms are still around, and they're not going away. And so... There's a lot of people today, so here's something that's going on today. There's so many parents today who think, I can protect all my, my children from every storm. <laughs> they won't ever suffer. I could just make sure everything goes well for them. And of course, that's 
somewhat to our responsibility. You should teach them wisdom, how to avoid certain kind of evil people. Don't do evil acts. Study well, do well, you know, hopefully ma um, marry somebody that will be good for them, all that stuff. But we think we could just shield them from every storm. And you know, it doesn't work. The whole thing is just a lie. <laughs> Parents, you cannot shield your children from the storm. <laughs> you cannot be there for them for every storm. You could, don't, you, if you put them into a little box <laughs> so they didn't, nobody ever hurts their feelings, they have every food they want, and you can give them the iPad so they can be quote unquote happy, and then they grow up in the, and then you know what storm they'll have? The fear of themselves. They won't know how to be good friends. They will start to think, I'm not very capable in life. And what if nobody likes me? They'll go through that storm. <laughs> and that's happening all around our society today. Helicopter parenting, it's a bad, bad, bad idea. Life is storms. Let me say something else. Um, I want to say, if you... I'm not saying just get out there and jump into the storm and suffer, okay? I'm saying be wise. Some things are extremely painful, and it's wise to learn how to avoid them. But um, I want to say this. If you are extremely blessed, very blessed, if you are very, very blessed, do you know you're still going to hit really, really painful storms? <laughs> things that you feel might make you go down. I'll just um, give you a few, ex I'll tell you about our life, because I know ours. Now let me just say this, Grace and I are extremely blessed people, extremely blessed, right? Um, Grace is sixth generation Christian. We have an incredible Christian heritage. I'm fifth generation Christian. We both had loving parents. We've both been largely very, very healthy. And of course, we were, we got to grow up in America, which is like having a lottery ticket in history. And she grew up in New York City, the poor side of New York City, but that's one of the richest and most prosperous places in the world. And I grew up here in Silicon Valley. This is a lottery ticket of history. And um, my wife is pretty. I think she's very pretty. So she got those genes. She's very smart. She says she's not very smart, but she's wrong. <laughs> okay? She's very, very smart. And so we have those kind of blessings, too. You know, I got some pretty good genes. I'm pretty good. You know, like I'm decently good, above average smart guy, can do well in school. And apparently I don't have ADHD. I can focus, you know? I can study. I've got, like, I've got staying power to do things, and not all of you have that. A lot of people don't have that. Um, but let me just give you a few things that just in these very blessed people, we're extremely blessed. My wife has fought depression and been in really, really dark, low places. Her mom died of cancer. Um, we lost Grace's mom in her early 60s. And so we have this wonderful picture of Grace's mom holding Elizabeth when Elizabeth was a tiny little baby, but Elizabeth never got to know her grandmother. Uh, Grace lost her, some of you know about this, just a few years ago. <laughs> it was the week before our church launched. Grace's father died of a massive stroke. I've been incredibly healthy for most of my life, but when I was 29 years old, I had hydrocephalus. And then I had um, an infection in my shunt. That means there's too much water pressure in your brain. And then the infection almost killed me. <laughs> and it, I had to be in the hospital for multiple months, and I had to relearn how to walk because <laughs> I didn't have good balance. And I had to relearn how to chew and swallow. And there's periods in there when I couldn't talk. So I would, I'd be able to talk one day. Next day, I could not talk. I'd talk for two hours. No talking the next two hours. And I couldn't drive for 
at least six months. And I lost 30 some odd pounds, and I was a little skinnier back then. <laughs> so I went from skinny to sickly skinny. <laughs> um, I'll give you one that my youngest daughter, my wife, she's a perfectly healthy person. She had something called preeclampsia during our pregnancy with Elizabeth, except then um, it turned out to be a much more serious thing. It was called the health syndrome, H-E-L-L-P. I'll, I'll, I'll just read this out. This is, I, I wanted a quick little definition, so I, I Googled it. Health syndrome is a life-threatening pregnancy complication, life-threatening pregnancy complication, usually considered to be a variant of preeclampsia. That's high blood pressure when the mother is um, pregnant. Um, our OBGYN, when I, Grace came in because she was in a lot of pain, eight weeks premature, and our OBGYN, she said this really calmly. She said, Mr. Park, I'm so glad you came in. If you had just waited just a little bit longer, you would have lost your baby, and your wife would have gone into seizures. I said, oh, thank you for that little piece of information. She said that so calmly. But everything's fine. We're going to do an emergency C-section. Everything was great, and then it wasn't. <laughs> We've had numerous times in our life when our finances look bad. <laughs> I've looked at my checking account when it's under $100. Like, that's all the money I have, multiple times. And I'm a father with three young children. And these are people who are extremely blessed. Um, I want to say this to you if you're young today. Um, I'm not trying to scare you, but there are so many anxious people today. I understand why you're anxious, because you feel like you have to go out into the world, and you have to be good enough to make it through these storms. Well, let me already tell you, let me give you the bad news first. You're not good enough. <laughs> so you know why you're scared? Because you already know you're not good enough. But let me give you a good news. There's a God who'll be in the boat with you if you call out to him. <laughs> and he is more than good enough. Okay? Let's go to part two. The ultimate storm of the cross. I'm going to take you to this verse, Isaiah chapter 43, which I gave you last week. I want you to think about it again today. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. For I am Yahweh your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This promise from God, you know what it's intended to make them think about, Israel to think about? There was a time in Israel's history, it was like this. We got to go into the waters. If we don't go into the waters, there's an army behind us, and we will die. <laughs> you guys know this story? You, haven't you watched the movie? <laughs> you probably watched the movie. Prince of Egypt, <laughs> the Ten Commandments. Well, that's not just a movie. It was real. <laughs> just like this incident in Mark chapter 4, it really happened. So how was Israel saved? They have to cross through the waters, through the Red Sea. And God says, you are my people, and I love you. There's no army in this world that can kill you if I take you. And he paused, and he just and he made these waters part and they were saved. And when the Lord is saying this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. You know what he's saying is, don't you know who I am? Don't you know who you are with me? Your life, you will pass through waters, and I'll be your Savior. But I want to say something about this. Um, there's this 
thing that we teach in this church. You might have heard of it. We call it the gospel. And in the gospel, I want to tell you the gospel. Some of you are like, oh, you're going to get to the gospel in part two? Yeah. <laughs> Surprise, I can shift it up on you. Do you know what? There is a storm as you try to pass through the waters. But there is an ultimate storm. <laughs> there was a storm of the judgment of God. God looked at the whole world. You know why there's always bad storms breaking into our lives? Because God is life. <laughs> he gave us life. He says, I'll give you eternal life. But God is life every day too. If life you think is just what I eat, what I drink, what are my successes, what is my wealth, what is my health, what is my looks, how many people like me, if that's all you think life is, you don't even know what life is. God is life. <laughs> if you have God in your life, that's why we sing it. Christ is more than enough because Christ is God in the boat. But if we will live life without God, then there will be death. <laughs> and the death is earned. Because you can't keep going on in life without God and thinking you're going to live. The storms will come. And the storms will get you. So Jesus, you know, here he is on this boat. We're going to die. <laughs> come on, Jesus. And he wakes up and he says, what are you worried about? <laughs> and he stills the storm. But do you know this story is not just about a miracle on some waters? The story is that there's an ultimate storm of our judgment from God. <laughs> I don't know if um, you think about this, and we're not generally supposed today, oh, you're not supposed to talk about this. But you know, you're going to stand before God one day. It's called Judgment Day. Your whole life will be assessed. And when God assesses your whole life, do you know that your life, that assessment, is going to be perfect? Be the absolute most objective, perfect, most wise, most righteous assessment on your whole life. Your whole life. And if your life has no God in him, or you're just junking him away, just using him, then over time he's going to say, who are you? I'm not in your life. And there will be a storm, the worst storm there ever is. All throughout this life, every storm that we face let me say it in a strange way. On the one hand, it is a warning from a God who is jealous, who loves you, and wants to give you nothing but himself. But as long as we choose not God, I, sorry, Jesus, I just want the money. <laughs> sorry, Jesus, I just want some more health and comfort. He'll keep sending some storms as a reminder I'm life. <laughs> and it's actually strange because the storms can be very painful, extremely painful. But you know, as long as you're still alive, they're actually a piece of love. <laughs> but there will be a day when there'll be no more chances. <laughs> and there'll be an ultimate storm. So, everybody's life will be judged. <laughs> and that storm of God's wrath, and use that word that we're not supposed to use today. It's like, well, it's such a mean word. That's the Bible's word. If you will not be with God, he will say, okay, then you can have your way. You can be without me forever. <laughs> and his rejection will be given to you and that's a very, very serious storm. But this is why Jesus came. 
Jesus came to be one of us. I told you last week, this absolutely outrageous thing, almighty God, one with humanity, to say, I will take on that storm. <laughs> he will take on the most ultimate storm of the wrath of God. And he will get into the boat that will take on the most horrible storm. And that boat was not a boat. It was a cross. And he said, I will take the storm and all of death will come upon me so that if you will be in my boat, if you will make yourself one with me, if you will get in this boat that I call the cross, all the storm of death and wrath will come upon me, but it won't go on to you. <laughs> I will take it and I will still that storm for you so that forever and ever you can have peaceful waters with me. It's the promise of the whole Bible. It talks about the Lord is my shepherd, and he leads me beside still waters. And for God to take us into still waters when we say, no, we don't want you, there was going to be, there has to be storms because there cannot be life without God. There will be storms that sink us. And so Jesus says, let me come. And I'll take on the ultimate storm for you. <laughs> let me close with part three. This is what, this is at the center of Christianity. We were talking about this in admission, uh, in, in, um, membership class today. The gospel is the good news. The way I want to say it today is that God became human to take the ultimate storm and still it so that you were still waters forever. <laughs> but you know, we're still living this life and you have Jesus <laughs> and you know, it's not still sometimes. It's still a painful world. It's still a sinful world. Gosh, I'm still a sinful person in many, many ways. And so we're still going to face this. And so I want to close by talking about this final question, and I want to close with some comments about thinking about how the gospel lives as you think about the storms today. You know what the gospel offers you? That you can be a more than a conqueror. You can conquer the storm. You can conquer the pain. You can conquer the fear and the anxiety. You can be more than a conqueror. Why? Because someone's with you. <laughs> I entitled this last part, More Than Conquers Through Emmanuel. You guys know that's usually a word we use at Christmas. <laughs> You guys know what Emmanuel means? It just means God with us. You know what Emmanuel is? That God became human. So that now that you see the man God, the human God, who goes through the storms with us, for us, and will face the ultimate storm, you know that means God will never leave us. You know, there's um, other doctrines of God. Hindus believe in gods. They could maybe bless you or they could condemn you. The Muslims believe in a God that's so transcendent. You could do everything right. You could do the five pillars so you're blue in the face. But once you get to judgment day, they say all you got is this thing called inshallah. You know what inshallah means? If God wills, I was as good a Muslim as I could possibly be. But if Allah decides, nah, he can. But that's not the Christian type teaching. There is a man, and he is Emmanuel forever. <laughs> he died, but he's risen. And he is 
one with God. The humanity and the divinity is one with God. And in him is God with us. Your humanity, his humanity, he wants to offer to you so that he'll be with you. So I want to close this way. Um, I have um, my, my younger brother. Uh, he grew up here in Silicon Valley, and he and I both went to Saratoga High School. Saratoga High School is very secular. It was a rich school. It was the first school I ever went to that was rich. It was like 95% white and rich. Then I finally had culture shock, okay? I've lived in all kinds of poor neighborhoods that were diverse, and then I had culture shock when I was 14 years old. And he had a group of good buds, about maybe about a dozen guys that he was close to all throughout high school, and he was the only Christian. <laughs> he was the only Christian. And then one of these guys... I think he went off to UC Berkeley, and somehow he got involved with University Christian Fellowship. He grew up in a Catholic household, and then Jesus got to him. He came back home, hanging out with his buddies. He loves his buddies, so he starts telling them about Jesus, <laughs> and they thought he was so annoying. <laughs> they were like, come on, man. You go off to Berkeley, get Jesus, and now you're so annoying. But my brother was like, wow, that was amazing. So there was two of them. Then a few years later, they're young adults, you know, one or two getting married, and the other guy started dating this Christian gal, and she took him to church, and he found Jesus. And then she dumped him. <laughs> so he got that storm. But he still knew Jesus. And then he would talk about Jesus. And the other guys were, now you're annoying. <laughs> and one of the guys said, while they were hanging out one day, he said, you know what Christians are? They're just these people. The reason they are into this Jesus thing is because they're weak. They need this crutch to get through life. And that's what Jesus is about. He's this crutch. And... In this group, you know how it's like. It's a group of a dozen guys, but some guys are closer to others. My brother was close to these two or three other guys. One of the guys he's really close to, he, when that other guy was saying this very cynical thing, he leaned over and said, you know, he said, you know, Pilsang, you know, um, I used to think exactly that. <laughs> I don't think that anymore. This guy's not a Christian. Never been to church or barely ever. I think he went to church once or twice. But he goes, but I know Christians now. And it's really weird. Christians are among the strongest people I know. <laughs> they always talk about how they're weak, how they need Jesus. But then something really hard happens in their life, and they can make it, and they come out better on the other side. Non-Christian guy. And I want to share that with you today, especially if you don't know Jesus. I want to share that with you today if you think you do know Jesus, but you are weak. So let me say a couple things. That guy who said he was cynical, all oh, these Christians, they're just weak people. We are weak people. Or no, we know we're not going to make it through the storm. We know. Because we know that, we know we better have somebody better. That's why we turn to Jesus. And if you still don't know that about yourself, you're delusional. <laughs> you think you're good enough to make it through the storm. We'll see you back at church today. Maybe in six months, maybe a year, maybe in two years. I told you, I wait for people to crash their car. That's the other analogy I used. When the boat starts sinking, we'll see you again. Maybe you'll remember this message. Jesus will rescue you. I want to close with this uh, verse. Uh, when we were at the retreat, 
Michael Chung said Romans 8 is like the peak of the Bible. I don't know if I agree with that, but it's up there, okay? I want to give you the ending of Romans chapter 8. Here's how it goes. I condense it just a little bit, just for the sake of time. Verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You know, it's strange because we think, okay, does all things mean like a perfect wife, no cancer, no layoffs? Apparently it doesn't mean that. It's very interesting. God lets the Christians suffer. He lets us go through storms. Jesus is God. Didn't he know the storm was going to be there? He probably did. See, that was part of the mystery. But he went to sleep. But it wasn't to keep them from the storm. God will let you go through storms. But can you believe that he has, in Jesus, graciously given you all things. Can you sing that song? Christ is enough for me. No matter what you're going through right now, he has graciously given you all things in him. Verse 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised you know what that means? You think you're going to die, but you will be raised. <laughs> Whatever hellish thing you're going through right now, it'll never be the final say. Never. The cancer, maybe you think your marriage is going to end. <laughs> maybe you're just in such a dark place and you are thinking about ending it. It'll never be the final say. Christ has been raised, you will be raised. He is sitting at the right hand of God. He is interceding for you. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? We don't even have those things in America. We don't have tribulation. Well, not too much. We don't generally have persecution. We certainly don't have famine, judging from our weight. So what can separate us from the love of Christ? None of these things. Verse 37. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. We are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. Because of Jesus it's not a if you will overcome the storm. It's when you will overcome the storm. Can you believe that? That's the truth. That's the truth. For I'm sure that neither death nor life. Now, watch this list. Death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come. Nothing that is to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Is he in your boat? Will you get in his boat? Will you climb into the boat where he has taken on the ultimate storm for you so he'll be in your boat? and take you through every storm of this life. Let's pray.